I first saw Srila Prabhupada in 1969. I had had a little bit of association with the devotees before that, but I went to the temple in uh, 1969, and Prabhupada, that was when the temple was on La Cienega Boulevard in Los Angeles. And um, Prabhupada came to the temple that afternoon to give a lecture. And I remember being really struck by the fact that here was a perfect uh, person. At that time, of course, the perfection was all external in my eyes. I was always looking for a person who had perfect poise, perfect style. Uh, and uh, when Prabhupada got out of the car, and stood up, I thought, here is, a, he's, he's perfect. He's perfect. He's a perfect dresser. He's a, uh, in the midst of all this turmoil, Sankirtan turmoil, he was just like aloof, I would suppose, but not aloof in terms of cold, but he was just like gliding through all this chaos and he was perfectly self-centered. And I was so struck by that. He gave a lecture. I haven't the vaguest idea what the lecture was about. But, you know, you get caught up in the enthusiasm and the... Then, uh, after the lecture, he got down from his Vyasasan and uh, he led us all in a line dancing around the temple room and he'd stop in front of every uh, picture, they had these big paintings, Jadarani's paintings on the wall, and he'd stop and put up his arms and just sway back and forth, and everyone, we were all in a line behind him, and we were all swaying and screaming and jumping, and he was just so ecstatic. He was so, uh, it was just an extraordinary experience, you know, the most extraordinary experience, as we know now, that any person within the universe can have. In relation to my name, I remember a few years later when I was in Mayapur, and we only had the first guest house there, and Prabhupada would go for his morning walk, walking between the... the uh, little levees or banks between the rice fields. And uh, we, were walking, we were just leaving the, the back of the building and Prabhupada said, Bhavananda. And he said, do you know what Bhavananda means? And Gargamuni Maharaj said, yes, it means one who's absorbed in the ecstasy of bhava. Prabhupada said, no, it's, that's Bhavananda. His name is Bhavananda. He said it means one who takes endless enjoyment in this material world. I should have taken warning then, I'll tell you. <laughs> and uh, I said, Prabhupada, he said, yes. He said, but that is because bhava means birth in this world. And he said, that is a devotee. A devotee takes endless enjoyment in this material world because it offers endless opportunities for preaching. When Prabhupada came back to Los Angeles, must have been again in 19, no, it was 1970, um, he, we rented a little house on Formosa Avenue off of Melrose Avenue there. And uh, Karander and I were fixing the place up and we built an altar and I was decorating the altar and put up a curtain. And I really wanted to see Prabhupada, but who was the... Oh, I think it was Gargamuni. He said, no, no, you have to be... Go in, Prabhupada's on his walk. We want you in there. Do your business on the altar. You know, set it all up. So when he comes back, everything is ready and you're not there 
right? I kept saying to Karanda, I said, geez, I'd really like to see Prabhupada. And Karanda said, no, nah. he said, we have to, you know, we have to do what they say, just do our business and get out. And bingo, Prabhupada walked in the door. So Krishna satisfied my desire, fortunately. And he looked, he said, oh, very nice. He looked at the altar and he loved it. He said, you have done this? I said, yes, Srila Prabhupada. He said, well, he said, you see the difference. He said, you, you are designing, you can design a, a disco and go to hell. Or you can design Krishna's temple and altar and go to Baikunta. All right. And then we left. So I was happy. In the beginning, they used to have, they'd pick two or three devotees from the temple in L.A. who could go walk behind Prabhupada on the morning walk. Uh, usually not very much was said. However, he did do one thing. This was the first time when he had that little house in Beverly Hills. We drove him up to below sunset, between Santa Monica and sunset in Beverly Hills. Were all those huge houses and you know huge cars. And Prabhupada would walk down the palm lined streets, and I was walking right behind him. And of course, my eye was attracted to all these you know magnificent mansions and you know gorgeous gardens and and I. You know, I was being more attracted to that than to Prabhupada. And at one point, Prabhupada coughed. Just as I was thinking that, you know, I was, he coughed and he just turned and he spit right on the lawn of one of those big houses with such, like, disdain, you know? So I learned that lesson. <laughs> he said... I have so many palaces all over the world that I can stay in. He said, practically speaking, there's no difference between me and the Goswamis in terms of our lifestyle. He said, they stayed under a different tree every night. I stay in a different palace every night. They wrote, I write. He said, originally, I did not want to come here. He said, Krish not to America, but to this world. He said, Krishna asked, I want you to write those books. Come down and write those books. And I said, I don't want to come to that. I don't want to go to that material world. And he said, Krishna said, don't you worry, I'll take care of everything. You write those books. That was the first and only time that I've ever heard or read, I might be wrong, where Prabhupada actually spoke about Krishna speaking to him and how he didn't want to go. And he made that face, you know, that, you know, his upper lip kind of, I did not want to go to that world. He said, I will take care of everything. You just come down and write those books. The atmosphere when he said that was just, you know, it was like, Nothing I've ever experienced, ever. I once said to him, Prabhupada, I said, I am so lusty. I said, my eyes go everywhere. He said, oh, that, will, that means you are going to go blind. I said, blind to material nature, I hope, Prabhupada. He said, no, blind. <laughs> Oh, dear. When we flew in 1972 from Nairobi to Bombay, 
Uh, Shama Sundar Prabhu had forgotten to include Prabhupada's yellow fever card in his passport. So when we arrived at Bombay Airport, they put Prabhupada in quarantine. Right, some like little hospital out on the out in the airport. So I stayed with him, and I w would wake up in the middle of the night. And it was a lovely building with a big, big veranda and nice chairs and everything, and a big screened-in veranda. And I, Prabhupada would, you know, pace up and down there, and chant in the middle of the night. And then I, I was sleeping in the room next to him, and I heard, Bhavananda, Bhavananda. I got up in the night, I was half asleep. Prabhupada was furious. He had been chanting, and he decided he wanted to go out into the little garden that they had in front of this hospital. We were the only ones in the building. But it was all uh, mosquito netted in, the whole... So he went to go out through the, and a guard stopped him. They wouldn't let him out because their fear was, oh, a mosquito will bite him, and he'll, the mosquito will pick up the yellow fever if he has it and spread it around. So they wouldn't let him go out. He was so angry. He said, I have never, he said, do something, do something. It's like three o'clock in the morning, you know, and what could I do anyway, you know? I was just a, a little pipsqueak. So I just let him yell at me because he was so angry. Do something. They have trapped me here. Uh, he said, I have never been able to be confined. He said, I cannot stand to be confined. He said, here I am. It's like a bird in a golden cage. He said, it's a lovely building, but I can't go outside. He said, do something. Do something. Very upsetting when he says, says something like that, and you know that there's nothing, there's really nothing you can do. I remember I, I planted a hundred rose bushes, or maybe it was two hundred, at Mayapur, and uh, Guru Kripa and Jasoda Nandana and Gargamuni, they all came. It was just before the festival. They came from Japan, and they were commenting, you know. God, what has he done? He's planted some rose bushes, right? The next day, Prabhupada came. Uh, he was ecstatic. He walked from the front gate down, we had put in the road by then, down the road to the guest house. And I had planted a lot of flowers and those hundred rose bushes. And Prabhupada was walking around the veranda on, on his floor. And he was standing there and looking out over the campus, he would call it. He said, so, he said, this is your success. He said, when I'm able to look out from this balcony and everywhere I look I see flowers, he said, that is your success. I said, gee, I said, you know, some devotees were like criticizing me because I'm planning. He said, no, he said, you must have flowers. He said, in Goloka, every tree, every plant, everything has flowers on it. That's why he used to object to uh, some of the paintings in the Bhagavatams, you know, where they have like English forest scenes that's supposed to be Goloka. But I, I would say to them, there are no flowers on the trees. I said, in Goloka, there's flowers all the time. I said, Prabhupada said that. It was so hot. It was unbelievable, and he had called all the devotees, and, but in the meantime, you know, he had sent them all back. So it was very quiet in Vrindavan, and, and it was very hot, and I had like a heat stroke attack. And I don't know why, I don't know why, I didn't know why then, I was on the plane flying, I just decided to leave and go back to Mayapur. Right? So Prabhupada said, all right, if that's what you want to do, who will do your service here? And he said, oh, Shatadana. He said, all right, that's fine. So I'm on the plane going back to my I said, 
why? What, what is wrong with me? Why did I leave? Why did I leave? You know, it was like perfection, the perfection of life, to be able to serve the lotus feet of Prabhupada in Vrindavan, you know? And it was so intimate, so close. Why did I leave? I got to uh, Calcutta, drove out to Mayapur, I think that was like the 7th of July. And on the 8th of July, I was sitting in the garden, and suddenly there was this huge brouhaha, people running, oh, the Muslims have attacked, blah, blah. and there was huge amounts of people, and I, I shot them. Uh, we were arrested. I was in jail for like three weeks, and I was a mess because I thought, oh God, I've destroyed Prabhupada's entire preaching mission in India, right? So at one of the courtroom hearings where you stand in the dock and there were thousands of people in the middle of Navadvip. Oh, God, what a nightmare. Uh, Jai Pataka kind of inched his way over to the dock that we were standing in. He said, how are you? I said, oh, I was holding up. Actually, I had a nervous breakdown, you know, one of my many. And uh, he said, well, he said, Prabhupada said you did the right thing. What a relief. He said, Prabhupada said you did the right thing. You were protecting the ashram and protecting the deity. He said, he said you did absolutely the right thing. He also said, they were coming to find the old man. When he heard about it all, he told them up in Vrindavan. He said they were, they were looking for the... Because when the police came... <clears throat> they kind of ran right by us and went running throughout the whole guest house looking for Prabhupada. Of course, he wasn't there. He said they were looking for the old man and they took Bhavanananda instead. He was arrested in my place. Nice. That was nice. He was taking his morning walk on the road at Mayapur and uh, he walked up to like the jog pit and then would walk back. When we came back to go into the temple, you know, through the gate, Prabhupada decided he wanted to go to the Ganga. So there was that steep embankment and then you go to those fields. So, you know, it was fairly steep and I put my, I got down on the side of the bank and put my arm up and Prabhupada, you know, was leaning on my arm and I, <coughs> excuse me, helped him down the bank, then he pushed my hand away, like very abruptly. And I was like a little shocked. And Prabhupada said, that is the Mayavadi. He said, they take your help and then push you away. He said, you take the help of the guru and then you reject the guru to become God. He said, that is the Mayavadi. So it was... It's simply not even nice to be a Mayavadi is what I understood. You know, I mean, they have no concept even of manners, you know, on a transcendental level. Take your help and then push you away. Yeah. Prabhupada repeatedly told me and others that the big Mayapur Chandradoya Mandir uh, Oh, that's a story. The name of Maya Purchanda Doya Mandir. It was in Calcutta, and Jai Pataka and I were in the room, and Prabhupada, he was trying to decide whether it should be called Maya Purchandra Udoya or, or Chaitana Chandra Doya Mandir. He said, What do you think? So I said, Maya Purchandra Doya. I said, I love that name. I said, Because it, we want to make Mayapur famous also, along with Lord Chaitanya, and this will make it, you know, make the word Mayapur out into the public, you know, for, he said, all right, that Mayapur, but he would, he would use them intermittently, uh, not intermittent, you know, like interchangeably, but yeah, it was Mayapur Chandra Dharmandir. So, in talking about the big temple, Prabhupada said again and again, I want a big dome. 
big, and he'd hold his hand up like that, big dome. And he had been to, that must have been 1976, when he had been to Washington for the bicentennial, and he saw the Washington Cap, you know, the United States Capitol building, and he loved that big, that's what he wanted, a big dome. It's so imposing. No one will listen to me. I feel like Cassandra, you know. No one, he, again and again and again, a big dome. But now they, they don't have a big dome. It's the wrong kind of architecture, I think. But, you know, I don't have any real say, but I can state my case anyway, because it is what Prabhupada told me. You know, Prabhupada instructed me a lot about Mayapur. And uh, he wanted escalators, you know, moving, moving stairways. Es- what do you call escalator? Yes, escalator, going up to different levels with the exhibits. That he sp- definitely wanted, and he wanted one big dome. And the universe, it's not such a complicated thing, the way he described it. He said the universe should be hanging like a chandelier from the middle of the big dome. And all the specifics of what life is like on the different planets and the hellish planets and the heavenly planets and Baikunta and and Golok, that should all be on exhibits going up on the side of the building with the moving stairways, with the escalators. But the main temple itself, it should be covered by one big dome. That's what he wanted. They were doing kirtan in the temple at Mayapur. It was during a festival. And there was a... Uh, what was the tune they used? Because it, it lent itself to saying Gadadhar. Gadadhar, Sriva... But it wasn't that melody. It was one of those newer melodies. Prabhupada called me in and he said... They are singing Gadadhar. He said it is Gadadhar. But no one ever listened to me. I told everyone, but they all continued to just chant Gadadhar because it was more syncopated, I guess, for the melody. But melody shouldn't take precedence over the name. Well, a few years later, there was a lot of difficulty with Prabhupada's wife and his daughter they were having some real problem in the house that they lived in, which was her, her father's house down there on Mahatma Gandhi Road. There was some, like, really, you know how the Bengali people get really family, like, practically fratricidal wars, you know, where they divide the houses in half right through the bathroom, you know, every, they're really crazy in that way. So, The family, his wife's family was giving them a lot of, and they were frightened. And his son, Vrindavan Chandra, had told Prabhupada that. So Prabhupada called Tamal and I in and asked us to go to Calcutta to speak to his wife and his daughter and tell them that he wanted them to come out to Mayapur and he would care for them. They could live there and everything. And uh, forget who who it was. It wasn't me. and I don't think it was Tamal. But someone said, maybe it was Jai Pataka, I'm not sure. Prabhupada, you're, you know, an international famous person. Won't people criticize that the sannyasi is living, you know, his wife and family are living in the same. Prabhupada said, that does not matter. He said, in an emergency, that transcends everything. That transcends all these sannyas things. He said, it's an emergency. We take the walks in the morning, and Prabhupada, Prabhupada would say, oh, I want, you know, build that there and do this and do that. And I would always say, Prabhupada, where's, you know, where's the money? Where's the money coming from? And he, it's the only time he ever raised his voice to me, even though he 
probably should have a lot more. But that one time he said, why you are always worried about money? Why you are always worried about money? You do not think Krishna will provide? Then later in the morning, he called me into his room and Tamal was there with Gargamuni. And he said, Bhavananda, our Bhavananda, he would always call me our, our Bhavananda, he is always worrying about money. Now I want you to see that he never has to worry about money again. Whatever he wants, you give him so he can develop this Mayapur. Tamal and Gargamuni, he nailed them. He said, he should not have to worry. <laughs> when we started giving out kitchery, and then, you know, we built that big hall, Prashadam Hall, and uh, some of his godbrothers were, com- were criticizing him. You're feeding kitchery on Lord Chaitanya's appearance day to the, the pilgrims. And Prabhupada said, if I don't feed them, Right, you're supposed to fast all day, right? So they're all complaining because we're feeding all the pilgrims. He said, if I don't feed them, they'll go up, onto the, up to the tea stall and eat fish. And, you know, they're going to eat anyway. So they might as well eat prashadam on our land. He said, we're not eating. But they, they, you can't expect them to fast. But we can't eat. They were so picky. You know, Prabhupada, but Prabhupada never gave in. You know, he always had the correct answer. If I don't feed them, they're going to eat fish. So we might as well feed them. But they had to eat everything there. He didn't want all the village people coming and taking the kitchery in little containers and going home. He said, because they'll mix it with fish. And he said, nothing will be accomplished. I was massaging Prabhupada, and he, uh, Gargamuni Maharaj came in to see him, and Prabhupada said, have you seen how Bhavananda is keeping a dead man alive? He said, you should watch how he's massaging me. He's keeping a dead man alive. He said, practically speaking, I should be dead, but he is keeping me alive. So Gargamuni was talking about different things with uh, Srila Prabhupada, and he mentioned that they really need me in Mayapur. And he said that, and then they went on to other things. Then Gargamuni Maharaj left. By that time, I was, because with Prabhupada, he, he would sit and you'd start on his head and you go down his body and you end at his feet. By the, I was massaging his legs, and Prabhupada said, hmm. This is the dilemma. He said, whether I should uh, continue to keep you here as my body servant. And he said, practically speaking, no one has ever, and I'm not saying this like for my own aggrandizement. He said, no one has served uh, Vishnupad as you have. Right? And by this time, I was at his feet. And I knew what was coming. And I started to cry. And he said, whether my own service, bodily service, is more important than the preaching. He said, that is my dilemma. He said, but I think you must return to Mayapur. And I was crying, and I was massaging his feet, and my tears were falling on his feet, but I just couldn't help it. And I, was, <laughs> I thought, wow, you know, this is really extraordinary. You know, here I am massaging Prabhupada's feet with mustard oil and my tears, right? And I, and I just was really crying. And I looked up, and Prabhupada was also crying. He said, no, he said, it must be. He must go back. He said, Mayapur is our preaching. 
This is one that really doesn't make me feel good, but I have to tell you, when near the end, or I, maybe it was three or four days before he passed away, I was sitting in the room with him. It was, oh, late at night. I was sitting in a chair, and the bed was there in Prabhupada's. And his eyes, he wasn't able to see very clearly at that point. You know, his eyes were roomy and his vision was, couldn't see very well. And he, he was resting and I was just sitting in the chair and there was a dim light on. And uh, he said, who is there? I said, it's Bhavananda Prabhupada. He said, oh, Bhavananda, don't ever leave me. Stay with me forever. How do you think that makes me feel? Jeez. I think about that a lot. Mm. It was so extraordinary. Don't ever leave me. Stay with me forever. Jai Anilo, 